I want to open this video with a content warning that while I'm not going to discuss any current events in this video, the level does deal with the subject of a virus, so this is a general warning for anyone who's fatigued of hearing about such things. The World of Tomorrow was released April 26th, 2016, and is set in the fictional seaside town of Sapienza, Italy. Incidentally, this is when I started playing these games. Sapienza is the home of Silvio Caruso, the first target for this mission. Silvio is a scientist working for the Ether Corporation, researching a DNA-specific virus which could be used to target someone from anywhere in the world. Imagine a bullet, fired in any direction, passing through countless bodies without inflicting harm, invisible and undetectable until it strikes its target. A world of armchair assassins killing with impunity. This is what awaits us, unless Caruso is stopped. Basically, it's Fox Die from the Metal Gear series. A virus which could spread unseen through the population until it eventually reaches the one person it's targeted for and activates. The client for the contract is an investor from the Ether Corporation who wants the virus destroyed for obvious ethical concerns. Caruso must also be taken out so that he cannot continue his research, but so must Francesca DeSantis, a fellow researcher on the project who is the only person with enough familiarity with it to continue the work without Caruso. Silvio is terrified of travel, an agoraphobic ball of anxieties who has forced the ether lab to be built beneath his large estate, to keep him from needing to leave his home to research. This estate, along with the lab in the basement, feels about the same size as the mansion in the Paris map. But what makes this level even more impressive is that there's also a substantial portion of the surrounding town to explore. The most immediately striking thing about this level is how different it looks to the previous one. The Paris level was set in a gorgeous dusk, with the outside of the mansion being bathed in orange, and with lots of deep blues and generally darker colors inside the fashion show. Sapienza pops with immediately vibrant colors, blues, yellows, greens, golds. It looks completely different to the first level in style, and it sets the tone perfectly. This is no longer a high-end black tie event. It's a relaxed vacation town, and it feels like being on a vacation. There are two major sides to the Sapienza map. Caruso's villa with the ether lab hidden below, and the surrounding town of Sapienza. Let's talk about that town first. The town of Sapienza is dotted with shops and apartment buildings. Some of the shops in the town are open, and some are closed. You start in a sort of town square, immediately in front of an ice cream shop. People are lounging around, sipping coffee, and enjoying the clear weather and sun. In this town square, you can also find a butcher's shop, an empty shop containing nothing but a baseball bat and a crate to hide bodies, a closed pottery shop, and a closed art gallery. The ice cream shop occupies the lowest floors of the town hall. You can easily break into the town hall from a basement entrance in the back, or a stairwell to the side. Above the ice cream shop, you can find empty town hall offices, a security office, and a tower which overlooks the whole map. You can also find the so-called Hippie's Apartment on the top floor, which lets you get the Bohemian disguise. Both the tower and the hippie's apartment offer excellent sniping positions, if you're willing to wait for a target to walk into view. Below the ice cream shop and town hall is a public bathroom, with two security guards hanging out, who you can overhear explaining the bodyguard presence in the town at large is due to Ether ramping up security on Caruso and the virus project. They put a lot of dough in this project, whatever the hell it is. Then why not place the lab somewhere more secure? <laughs> it's Caruso. He's a bit eccentric. Well, you met him. Apparently, he's got travel phobia and doesn't like to leave his home. He's their golden boy. So Ether just went and installed a state-of-the-art field lab on his private property. Big dough, man. <laughs> Some people always get their way. To the left of where you enter the level is the road out of town, and the site of an accident. Two flower delivery men headed for Caruso's mansion have hit a cyclist, and then proceeded to spin out and wreck their van. You can listen to the delivery men and the cyclist argue over who is responsible for the accident. Fine, fine, forget it. A man is somehow. Wouldn't want to be a bother. I know I got a tell about yet. Damn sun was in my eyes. Yeah. Get some shades, Dumbo. Christ, one more inch. I know, I know. I'm really sorry. Close call, but I guess, I guess I could have signaled more clearly. To tell you the truth, it's a way to cross the play, and I'm more worried about it than me. Well, uh, you 
know, we could always blame an animal. A uh, bird or, or something, maybe? I, it, you know, it swooped right in and attacked you. I barely got out of your way. Force mature kind of thing. But nobody's fault. Bird, huh? Yeah, yeah. We'll, look, we'll figure out something, buddy. We'll just wait here while my partner deals with our boss, okay? And then you can hitch a ride with the tow truck. As you leave the town square and head down towards the beach, you pass more apartments and shops. There are several intertwining roads here, which manages to give the illusion of being more open and expansive than the wireframe actually is. You can find and break into the International Flowers store, which is the same shop the delivery van is from. You can find a delivery man uniform here, as well as flowers. A couple outside the shop can be overheard discussing the Caruso family's history, rich and famous for the wine their vineyards produce, since medieval Florence. Further down the road, you can also find another empty shop, and a wine store, to break into. Straight out from this is the beach area itself, where you can find people relaxing, next to an open sewer entrance. Okay, past this, you can find a pier, with people relaxing and fishing. There's also a speedboat exit for the level here. In the general area, you can overhear several people complaining about toxic waste runoff drifting out of Caruso's secret lab. In the open area in front of the beach, you can find a street performer, a mime, putting on a show. These apartments are connected by the rooftop, and allow you to climb right back up to 47's safe house, which lends the level a great verticality. These levels are always smart about putting shortcuts in, which allow the map to be traversed quickly, and leave you tons of escape routes if you're being chased. One of these apartments is the home of one of the mansion security guards, and is filled with weapons, a mansion security outfit in the laundry, and a mansion keycard. A neighboring apartment belongs to a member of the staff of the nearby church, and contains a church staff disguise and the key to the church. The church staff member has actually left his stove on, frying something in a large skillet as he's left the house, which is not a great idea. To the east of the mime is a stairwell, which leads up to a terrace area with an Italian restaurant and a sanguine store, the same fashion line from the Paris show. Exploring the inside of the store is pretty neat. You can see several of the outfits from the fashion show on sale and on mannequins, and you can find the stylist outfit from the Paris level, now reused as store clerk, in the back. You can even see some flyers on a display mentioning the Ice Fashion Show, which I personally wouldn't be publishing after what happened, but hey. There's also a mansion security outfit stashed in one of the dressing rooms. I'm not totally sure what that's about. You can find a baseball bat in the back room, which I can only assume is kept there in case someone tries to break in, like 47. Although unfortunately, if you attack the one staff member in the store, he just runs and gets guards, since no enemy melee combat even exists in the game. Below all of this is a series of bathrooms and tunnels leading to a pier. These tunnels also have a weak wall, which can be turned into a route into the ether lab if you have some explosives on hand. The church is one of the major set pieces of the level. The morgue is off limits, and you can hear a coroner sent from an office out of town to come look at the body of one of the scientists being stored there, but who has been told her clearance isn't high enough by Ether Security. The mortician here has some great, extremely extra voice acting. For example, saying, I feel like today is going to be very busy. I just know it. Good for business. Inside the morgue, you can hide on the tables, holding bodies, and pretend to be a corpse in order to blend in. Next to the morgue is the church itself, with a large sanctuary, a basement with a security system, and a bell tower. You can even break the suspension on the bell in the tower and drop it down below. Behind the church is the graveyard, which is absolutely swarming with ether bodyguards. Below the church is a crypt, which also contains yet another route into the sewers, with the sewers themselves containing a route into a small hidden beach area. While you're in the sewers, you can actually stumble across the area that the well above leads into, and you can notice coins, bottles, and other junk people have thrown down the well. And that, broadly speaking, is the town of Sapienza. It's expansive, detailed, and you can easily avoid ever touching any of it. It feels like Sapienza was designed with the idea of elusive targets and remix missions in mind, secondary, shorter missions released onto the existing maps in later updates. Indeed, Sapienza contains four missions, World of Tomorrow, The Icon, Landslide, and The Author, the most missions on any map in the series as of writing. Many of the areas I've mentioned, like the Town Hall, don't really have any purpose in World of Tomorrow, other than being fun to explore. 
I'm going to talk about the bonus missions later on in their own video, but suffice to say, I think they're generally a huge win for the games, and add tons of replayability. Sepienza is also great fun for the game's Contracts mode, which is a sort of create-a-level mode where you can challenge other players to kill specific NPCs in specific ways or in specific outfits. In the context of World of Tomorrow, though, it goes a long way to have a large public area to explore. My favorite maps in the series generally have huge, crowded public areas to explore, and this is the first time we've really seen that. Now, let's move on to the Caruso Estate. This villa is built on and around the grounds of a much, much older castle. There's a few routes into the Caruso Estate. First is finding an appropriate disguise like delivery man, mansion security, or kitchen staff, and passing through the guards at the front gate. To the right of the main entrance, though, you can find a service entrance, which is locked by a keycard reader. This is probably the first of these keycard readers you'll come across in the game, and they can't be bypassed by the typical lockpick, but rather require either the appropriate keycard or for a disposable keycard scrambler to be brought into the level, which can be attained as mastery rewards on various levels. If you go to the apartment building with 47 safe house and out onto the roof behind the apartment though, you can find a crumbled wall which allows an easy way to bypass the frisk at the entrance and drop down into the Caruso estate. The pier behind the Sanguine shop contains a route up onto the cliffs behind Caruso's estate. These cliffs surround the manor, and some careful traversal can hold plenty of secret, subtle paths, with one behind the mansion even leading directly into the underground cove containing the ether lab. There's another staff entrance requiring a mansion keycard, leading into the kitchen basement, next to the Sanguine store. Although, as of time of writing, this door seems to be bugged so that it can only actually be opened from the inside, even with the keycard at least in the Hitman 3 version of the map. The Hitman 3 map ports are really buggy and expensive and you're probably just better off playing the old maps in Hitman 2 instead. There are two small buildings and two major buildings on the estate. The smallest of these, on the east side of the mansion, is a garden supply shed. On the opposite end of the estate is a kitchen, with a pantry and a staff lounge slash locker room area below. The observatory is a much larger building with much more incident. Essentially the Caruso family's private museum, full of art and artifacts to say nothing of the Plague Doctor disguise. It's also been converted into Caruso's private lab, which has almost entirely taken over the ground floor. This building also pulls double duty as a guest house, and is where DeSantis is living during her time on the Caruso estate. This leaves the final building, the mansion. The bottom floor of the mansion contains a large entry hall and dining room, along with several smaller areas like a study and a parlor room. The most interesting room on the second floor of the mansion is the bedroom of the deceased Isabella Caruso, Silvio Caruso's mother. One of the neatest touches of the map to me, which really speaks to the attention IOI pays to the margins of their maps, is that there are accessibility nods to the entire house that the elderly Mrs. Caruso would have used while still alive. For example, a chairlift on one of the main entryway staircases, or this seat in the bathtub connecting to Mrs. Caruso's bedroom. It's a series of small touches which are easy to overlook, and which are mostly completely inconsequential to the gameplay, but the fact that they're there speaks to IOI's incredible thoughtfulness on the design of these spaces as actual lived-in spaces, rather than just video game levels. A lesser game wouldn't have done that, and more to the point, no one would have noticed or criticized IOI if they hadn't, but the fact that they did is what puts these games on a whole other level. The third floor is by far the most interesting. It's surrounded by terraces overlooking Sapienza, and contains a large living space, full of moving boxes and furniture covered with bubble wrap. You can overhear two housekeepers talking about how Caruso heard that DeSantis liked a different style of furniture, and has started redecorating the mansion for her. Also up here are DeSantis' office and Caruso's bedroom. You can also drop onto the roof of the observatory here, offering a quick route out of the uppermost levels. Finally, at the very top of the mansion is an attic, mostly used for storage, along with some secrets we'll get to later. I really love the feeling of this mansion, and I think it's a huge credit to IOI's art direction that it feels wholly distinct from the previous level, set in Hitman is, perhaps appropriately, a game with a lot of time spent exploring mansions, but they rarely feel repetitive or recycled, instead feeling as diverse in design and aesthetic as actual real-life architecture is. Similar to the Paris map, there are tunnels beneath all of this connecting all of the buildings of the estate this time a wine cellar, as the Caruso family are known for their vineyards and wine production. You can also find the garage down here, as well as an entrance to the ether lab, heavily guarded and requiring a keycard. Behind the mansion is a large lawn and garden, which Caruso uses to practice his golf swing. At the far end of the garden, on the cliffs overlooking the ocean, you can find Mrs. Caruso's grave. Phew! 
but we're still not done yet. The Crusoe estate is built on the site of another, much older building, a sort of castle which is now in ruins. Some of these ruins are still intact and accessible. One lies just to the left of the manor's main gate, and another, much larger ruin lies behind a land bridge beyond Mrs. Crusoe's grave behind the mansion. The ruin behind the mansion is heavily guarded, but offers a large tower overlooking Crusoe's lawn, which is another perfect spot for some sniping, if inclined. This finally brings us to the Ether Lab. The Ether Lab is inside of a huge underground cavern below the Caruso estate. Like the estate itself, there are several routes into the cave. From outside the estate, there's a weak wall beneath the Sanguine Shop, which can be blown up, allowing entry to the lab, albeit not subtly. The ruins behind the mansion contain a cliff path leading into the entrance to the cove, which requires no keycard and might actually be the easiest route in. Other than that, though, you'll need a keycard to enter through one of the lab's official entrances one of which is heavily guarded by the garage, and two others of which are very lightly guarded, but hidden on the cliffs behind the mansion. Inside of this cave are a number of prefab modular buildings, containing security outposts, research labs, and ultimately the room with the virus itself. This is by far the most heavily guarded section of the level, and is full of guards and enforcers strategically positioned no matter which disguise you're wearing. Entering the virus room itself will either require a hazmat suit, or turning the ventilation system in the room on and both can be difficult to do and require careful timing. The virus room itself is populated by multiple scientists in hazmat suits, making the virus extremely difficult to access. You might have gathered from all of that that Sapienza is an absolutely massive level, far, far larger than Paris was. It's a huge map, probably the biggest in the first game, maybe Marrakesh excluded, but a Hitman level is only as good as the targets you're killing on it. What do those targets look like this time? The most interesting thing about the targets in World of Tomorrow, especially in contrast to the Paris map, is how your targets are themselves at odds with each other before 47 even gets involved. Let's get this out of the way first. Remember on Jason Ritter's yacht in Freeform Training how Isabella Caruso could be found lamenting how afraid she was of her own child? Well, it turns out she wasn't just a bad mommy. She was right to say her son Silvio Caruso made her skin crawl. When we find Caruso 20 years later, it quickly becomes obvious that he has murdered his own mother, and has developed a crippling complex about it. He keeps her room in perfect order, untouched. He's jumpy and neurotic, and deeply ashamed and guilty over his own mother's murder. This crushing guilt led to him having a complete nervous breakdown about one year before the events of the level, where he became convinced his mother's ghost was haunting him and seeking revenge. Following this nervous breakdown, the already reclusive and eccentric scientist began behaving even more erratically than he was already known for, which isn't exactly the trait you want someone researching an incredibly dangerous weapon to have. This is the true purpose of Francesca DeSanta's presence in the town of Sapienza, positioned as a second-in-command sent by Ether to lighten the stress on Caruso. In truth, she is a corporate spy sent by Ether, who view Caruso as a liability, to keep an eye on Caruso, and, more importantly, learn everything she needs to take over the project, with Caruso being sent into forced retirement. It gives the sense that if you weren't being hired to take Caruso down now, you'd probably be taking on a similar contract from either themselves in a few weeks' time. This gives the two characters a really interesting dynamic, very different from what we've seen so far, with the two targets already working against each other without 47's involvement. There was tension between Margolis and Novikov on the Paris map, with Margolis' assistant even suggesting that Margolis needed to hire a hitman to take Novikov out. But the targets on Sapienza are already hiding things, and even plotting against each other. The situation is tense, and 47 is smart enough to play that to his advantage. The two targets both mostly keep to the Caruso estate, unless prompted to do otherwise. Caruso can be found patrolling around his backyard, practicing his golf swing, and going to the private lab in his observatory. DeSantis, meanwhile, mostly keeps to the main house, specifically patrolling upstairs, in and around her office. The extra wrinkle on this map is destroying the virus, and I have to be honest, this is the part that's always kept Sapienza from being a personal favorite of mine. There are a few of these extra objective missions in the series, and I really don't think any of them work. But now, some 3600 words into the script, let's look at some of the ways all of this can resolve. As you're poking around the town, you can hear there's a private detective who's been hired by Francesca DeSantis, which seems like the perfect opportunity to get close to her. You can find the detective asleep on a bench in the town, and by turning on a radio nearby, you can wake him up and have him call DeSantis, before leaving to meet her down by the pier. Mr. 
that time some few loose ends. Yeah, yeah, just got it. Down. down at the pier? Sure. Straight away? All right, no time like the present. Um, see you in a bit. If you can manage to take him out and take his clothes on the way to the rendezvous, you can attend the meeting in his place. Taking him out is surprisingly hard, though, and could require some setup, or careful timing to do it silently. To make things even more complicated, he's a universal enforcer, who will become suspicious of Agent 47 even in his basic suit. Although, unlike the universal enforcer on the Paris map, this time it makes sense. A private detective would, after all, assumedly be used to looking over his shoulder and noticing the suspicious behavior of those around him. Once you've gotten the disguise and met with DeSantis, she asks to speak somewhere more privately, leading you to a secluded tunnel away from prying eyes. It turns out that the private detective had recently been hired by Caruso to acquire something, and DeSantis is trying to pay the detective off and find out what he's acquired. Uh, this is far enough. Mr. Falcone, what I am about to ask you might be highly unorthodox. Go on. About a month ago, Silvio Caruso hired you for an acquisition job. I need to know what exactly it was you acquired, and why. I'm afraid I can't do that. P.I. Confidentiality. I, I, I am willing to pay you handsomely. You could retire, hire others to dig through garbage. Don't think so. I like to get my hands dirty. <sighs> If you wanted to claim the moral high ground, you could have done so over the phone. Saved us both a trip. The question of what Crusoe got from the private detective will be followed up in another mission story later on. For now, a nearby dumpster offers the perfect chance to kill DeSantis and hide her body. As you're exploring the town of Sepienza, you can overhear people talking about how the scientists from Ether's field lab keep going to visit the nearby church for confession, as well as learn about a lab accident that left one of the scientists dead which has led to Ether forcibly taking over the local morgue, letting no one in and no one out. Going to the church, you can eavesdrop on one of these scientists confessing to her role in the lab accident that led to one of her friend's death. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been seven days since my last confession. Speak, child. Yesterday, I, uh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake and I may have lost his life. Hmm. A good man. Someone I knew who was... It was just a tiny little slip before I work, but even a small mistake can be catastrophic. They took me to their chapel here, and I want to pay my respects. Say how sorry I am. But he's dead, Father. And nothing I say will bring him back. If I go, am I merely being selfish? My child. Grief is for the living, not the dead. You do whatever you need to do, because your sorrow has ended, and the curse has not. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I will. If you carefully break into the morgue before the woman can make it there, there's a gurney you can lay on, blending in by pretending to be another corpse. An Aether bodyguard will sweep the room before letting the scientist in by herself, but won't suspect anything of a man lying dead in a morgue. As a fun aside, which I didn't know about until stumbling across it for this video, the morgue is one of the body dumps where the guards will carry body bags if they find a body nearby. Fun! You can hear the woman wax philosophical about her role in the disaster she's helping to engineer, giving an ashamed, almost willfully immoral speech to her departed friend. Room secure. Leave me, Bernard. <clears throat> I, uh, I want to be alone. Ma'am? You're dead, and you still look stressed out. <laughs> so, now I have you to feel guilty about. Great. We build a weapon that will kill 
thousands. And all we feel is intellectual curiosity. Isn't human psychology a laugh? <laughs> the scientist asked me if I'm still committed. Like we're on a crusade. We say this virus will end all war, but the truth is, we have no idea, and we don't care. We're just monkeys poking the unknown with a stick, and what of it? There is nothing as potent as an idea whose time has come. No, I don't have second thoughts. But still, being here, I wonder. Hey, if God is mad, give me a heads up, will you? Once you've taken her out, you can steal her keycard into the Ether Lab, as well as the deceased scientist's uniform, getting you the perfect way into the lab. This is actually where the mission story proper ends, mostly existing as a way to get you into the lab. However, the woman also drops an important USB dongle, which you can and should pick up. It turns out this woman is in charge of a failsafe, which, in case of emergency, can be used to safely destroy the virus from a distance if there's a potential breach. If you find the laptop controlling the failsafe on the other side of the ether lab from the virus, take out the scientist overseeing it, and plug the USB into the laptop, you can destroy the virus having barely set foot in the lab itself. This is my favorite way to destroy the virus and is usually what I end up doing on replays. If you're getting tired of inflicting all this physical violence on people, and would prefer to inflict some emotional violence on Caruso instead, then Beyond the Grave is the mission story for you. As you're wandering the Caruso estate, you can hear the staff talking about the nervous breakdown Caruso suffered a year earlier, where he became convinced that the ghost of his dead mother was haunting him. He heard her favorite record playing on the gramophone, saw her chairlift moving without being touched, heard the service bell beckoning staff to her room ringing, before going into her room in a moment of darkness and suffering a serious mental break. Since then, the volatile genius has become even more cruel to the staff should they touch any of the still intact pieces of his mother's room or the record he heard playing, but it seems that he is, for the moment, tentatively holding it together. That isn't to say that we couldn't get his breakdown to repeat, of course. All it would take is the slightest push. So, by carefully causing that sequence of events to repeat without being seen, you can get Caruso to enter his mother's room. By turning on a fan and getting her empty chair to start rocking, you can work Caruso up to his breaking point, causing him to pass out, alone in his mother's room, perfect for a neck snapping. Caruso is, it should almost go without saying, very, very Norman Bates. Speaking of references to movies, I've never seen True Lies, but this next one sure looks like a True Lies reference to me. DeSantis has started seeing Caruso's golf instructor, Roberto. You can hear some of the townspeople in Sapienza talking about how the golf instructor has quite the reputation as a womanizer, but how something about DeSantis seems to have him entranced and breaking away from his usual type. You can even hear the supposed womanizer nervously talking to himself by the cliffs behind the mansion trying to figure out exactly what to say to DeSantis next. If you enter DeSantis' bedroom, in the guesthouse observatory, you can find the stage set for a romantic rendezvous between DeSantis and Roberto. And by taking the golf instructor out and stealing his clothes and cell phone, you can call DeSantis and get her to come to the bedroom to meet with Roberto. It's me. Roberto? Silvio let you off early? I want us to meet. Your room. Mm, I should say no. But you won't. See you soon. The room is dark and, naturally, private, making it the perfect place to take DeSantis out, especially if you've poisoned the champagne waiting for her. Candos, my favorite. You are impossible, Candos. Look, don't talk. Just listen for a second. I like you, Roberto. You're a lot of fun, and I could even see this I, I, under the right circumstances. Mm. 
The situation, it's complicated. You see, Ether, the company I work for, they didn't just send me here to assist Caruso. They sent me here to spy on him. They fear he's becoming a liability. A threat. And from what I have seen so far, I think they might be right. This could be dangerous, and I thought you deserved to know. So, Now, my bosses, they, <coughs> they say you are a distraction, and they want me to break it off, so, <coughs> I don't know, <coughs> I feel so, <coughs> oh my god. If you don't poison her, or take her out, however, you can listen to her discuss her tense position on the Caruso estate how Ether is pressuring her to break things off with Roberto, and even explain what her true role on the estate is. Sitting outside the coffee shop is Dr. Oscar Lafayette, a celebrity therapist to the stars of sorts. If you eavesdrop on him, it becomes clear what he's doing in Sapienza. He's been hired by Ether as Caruso's new therapist, as the company is trying to mitigate the unstable genius breakdown as much as possible. The doctor is about to head to the Caruso estate to meet with him for their first session, with the two having never met before. Poisoning the doctor's coffee and following him to the bathroom lets you become Dr. Lafayette. Go to the mansion and attend the therapy session yourself. Oscar Lafayette, I have an appointment with Mr. Caruso. Ah, yes. Senor Caruso has been informed of your arrival. Please, follow me. I shall take you to his quarters. And may I say, it is well that you are here, Doctor. Master has not been himself lately. I, well, I only hope you are as good as they say. Don't worry, I am. Naturally, 47 is able to perfectly execute the session, going so far as to get Caruso to confess to the murder of his own mother. The renowned Dr. Oscar Lafayette. Mr. Caruso, shall we begin? If you insist. So, Ether sends a specialist to rummage through my brain. They must think I'm losing it again. Relax. Start by telling me what's on your mind. Isn't it obvious? I'm under a lot of pressure. Work. Mother died last year. Stress manifests itself in the strangest ways, I am told. Your mother, Isabella. Would you like to talk about her? Look, I... I know what you're driving at. My neuroses. My anxiety. My social phobias. Not the least my pathological fear of women. It's all deeply rooted. Go on. I had a girlfriend, you know. In high school. Pretty, too. Popular. And I was shy. Bookish. It shouldn't have worked. Not outside those stupid teen dramedies. But it did. For a short while, anyway. Then Mother decided that Emilio wasn't a good influence on me. So she paid the gardener's son to seduce her. He was 20. Roguish. Rode a motorcycle. Mother, she, she had pictures taken, showed them to me on prom night. Romantic love is fleeting, she said. Only a mother's love endures. What, what do you want me to say? I loved my mother and I hated my mother, same as everybody else. Isabella bullied you, shamed and belittled you, made you feel like a failure. All to keep you, a last and loyal son, from ever leaving, too. Stop it. I don't want to hear it. Your mother was a monster. Is that not why you killed her? What? How 
How dare you? You couldn't breathe. She smothered you. So you smothered her. Is that how it happened? Death. All right. I did it. I did it. Are you happy now? Is that supposed to be cathartic? Well, guess again, Doctor. Back to the drawing board. I think we have made some excellent progress. Same time tomorrow? Good day, Mr. Caruso. Big, big Norman Bates energy. Likely the first thing players will notice in the level is a woman straight ahead of the starting point yelling up to her brother, who is late for work. It turns out this man has just gotten a job as a kitchen assistant on the Caruso estate, and if you sneak up to the man's apartment, you can find a mansion keycard and a kitchen staff uniform, prime for the taking. Sneaking into the kitchen, you can learn that the head chef is frustrated as Caruso has been asking him to recreate his mother's tomato sauce, which she always used to make for him as a child. However, Caruso doesn't have the recipe, and so has essentially put the head chef on a wild goose chase. By the time you get to the kitchen, the head chef is ready to give up and says, you try to do it, see if you can get it right. The punchline here is when you go into the kitchen pantry and discover hundreds of cans of expired tomato sauce. Of course Caruso will never get tomato sauce like his mother used to make, because he's hired a team of professional chefs to recreate it, when his mother would just open a can of Chef Boyardee. I love this so much, it's such a well-observed and funny touch that feels so very human. In any case, you can mix in a can of the expired tomato sauce to finally get Caruso the flavor he craves. Or, more likely, you can mix poison into the sauce and handle him then and there. Lunch is served. Pasta bolognese. The Caruso style. Well... Hostile Environment is the name of the only mission story directly leading the player to destroying the virus. The room containing the virus is flooded with dangerous chemicals, which will instantly kill the virus should it have a containment breach, but also fatal to anyone who enters the room containing it. You can get rid of this gas by turning on the ventilation system to the room, but that will be highly suspicious. The easier way to handle this is by sneaking into the locker room and putting on a hazmat suit. Once you've entered the room, there are several scientists who you need to be careful of. One of them patrols in and out of the room, and so managing him only requires paying attention to timing. The other two, though, will notice if you try to turn up the virus temperature controls to levels high enough to destroy it, and even if they don't see you do it, will lower the temperature back to normal. The solution is to sabotage the other equipment in the room, with one distraction existing for each of these two scientists. As long as you're careful with your timing, you can sabotage a computer in one corner of the room and play a minigame from Resident Evil 2 in the other corner until both are distracted. With this done, you can raise the temperature long enough for the virus to be destroyed. I'm going to be honest here. I think this mission story is a pretty big misfire for this game. Getting direct access to the virus is fun the first time, but tedious on repeat playthroughs. Wearing the hazmat suit should keep you obscured from everyone. If I'm wearing a hazmat suit, I shouldn't have enforcers. No one is going to be able to tell that 47 isn't who he should be when he's wearing a full hazmat suit. The minigame to sabotage the chemicals is unlike anything else in the game, and is essentially just pick the two red ones, which doesn't feel like meaningful content. When the game first came out, I didn't know about the other methods to destroy the virus, like the USB dongle I mentioned before, or a particular stalactite, which you can shoot, that will fall from above and take it out. 
It took me a long time to find out about these other methods, and this being the only story mission that leads the player to destroy the virus, it makes the whole section feel really tedious when you don't know how to get rid of it any other way. What this meant was that, for a long time when I first played the game, if I wanted to replay Sapienza, I would usually boot it up, take out Caruso and DeSantis, and then quit out of the mission, not wanting to go through the ropes of taking out the virus. Sapienza is a great map, I would never say that it isn't, but the lack of direction for new players on other ways to take out the virus always made this section feel very linear, and it's always kept Sapienza from being a personal favorite, even though the rest of the map is brilliant. In the attic of the mansion, you can hear two bodyguards discussing how DeSantis has asked them to find the combination to a safe. Caruso is keeping something secret in the safe, and DeSantis wants to know what it is. Caruso is absent-minded, and writes things like safe combinations down all the time. And indeed, if you go downstairs to a locked room adjacent to DeSantis' own office, you can find the safe combination. When you go and open the safe, you find a bag full of samples of DeSantis' DNA, specifically hair clippings. Presumably, this is what the private detective from an earlier mission story was hired to collect. If you bring this to DeSantis, she'll be furious, realizing that Caruso is keeping her DNA as an insurance policy, and to quietly kill her once the virus is completed. She'll be distraught, and will go look into the fireplace, talking to herself about how betrayed she feels, and how she's absolved of her guilt once she has Caruso killed. When I have you killed. Luckily for 47, you can drop a propane tank into the fire from the chimney above, killing her instantly. Thanks for relieving me. In the observatory, which Caruso has converted into a private lab, you can find an old VHS player set up with a projector. Upstairs, above the lab, you can find an old VHS tape that Caruso had made. Bringing the tape down and putting it in the VHS player will start playing a cheesy montage of family photos Caruso had set to an extremely cheesy song. The next time he comes through, he'll be shocked and confused how the tape got in the player, similar to his reaction to the haunting opportunity. He'll banish his bodyguards from the room, transfixed on the old photos of his mother. There is a crate in the room, but by far the best place to hide is in plain sight. Crusoe has an authentic Plague Doctor outfit set up on display just next to the projector, and if you use it as an outfit, you can stand in the same position it was configured, blending in perfectly. There's even an item called the Circumcision Knife right next to the outfit, and a challenge to kill him with it while disguised as a plague doctor. I really need to stress how hilariously cheesy and bad the song playing over the film is, though. Like, it's incredible. Right next to the starting point of the level is the accident with the flower delivery van. It turns out the destination of this van was the Caruso estate, just a few yards away. The flowers are meant to be placed on Mother Caruso's grave, as it is the anniversary of her death. You can either take out the delivery men and take their outfits, along with some flowers, or you can break into the flower shop in town to get both, either way allowing entrance to the Caruso estate. Speaking to the butler, he will escort you to the grave, and notify Caruso that the flowers have arrived. If you hide back here, most easily in a crate near the grave, when Caruso arrives, he'll send his guards away, and start speaking to his mother's grave, offering the perfect chance to take him out. My favorite way to take him out here is with the wood chipper just next to the grave, which functions as a body dump, but can also be used to shred whoever is inside, disposing of the evidence. That's it for the mission stories, but there are still some great unmarked or hidden opportunities. My absolute favorite way to take Crusoe out in the level, and probably my favorite accident kill in the entire series, is with the exploding golf ball. The exploding golf ball can be found in 47's ICA safe house, and with some careful timing, or the golf instructor disguise, it can be deposited in Crusoe's pile of golf balls. The next time Caruso goes to practice his swing, The reason this is my favorite kill in the level is that it's marked as an accident kill. An accident. 
Oops, my golf ball exploded. Oh well, these are the dangers of the King's game. These things happen. It's just so silly, I love it so much. Of course, maybe you'd rather take Caruso out from afar. The ruined fortress behind Caruso's manor is filled with functional cannons, and by finding gunpowder and cannonballs hidden nearby, you can load one of them, which just happens to be pointed directly at Caruso's golf tee. This is the easiest of the cannon kills to set up, but there are other cannons and other ways to get kills, including challenges to take DeSantis out with the cannons, and to take Caruso's plane out with one while he evacuates. There's also one last way to take out DeSantis. If you destroy the virus before killing DeSantis, she'll go down into the ether lab to see what's going on, and you can kill her with a stalactite. This is on top of the usual ways you can find to take targets out as well, like finding opportunities to drop things from above, places to snipe the targets, or carefully timed ways to groat or headshot them. The mastery rewards on Sapienza are relatively tame. Two new syringes, this time a lethal and a nemetic, respectively. A breaching charge explosive, which can be used in place of a lockpick. Admittedly, I'm not sure why you would, since it's just a louder and less convenient version of a lockpick or crowbar. You can also get a firecracker to use as a thrown distraction or to ignite explosives, which is useful. There's also the regular roundup of starting locations and agency pickups, with the most useful being starting in the ether lab, which gets you extremely close to the virus very early on. Your reward for hitting 20 is a sniper rifle capable of piercing bodies and letting you slow time while aiming, which seems like it would probably be very useful if I ever used a sniper rifle other than the Seeger 300 Ghost. Overall, there's nothing quite as fun as Napoleon Blown Apart from Paris, or as useful as some of the later missions' mastery rewards. Now, let's talk about some fun easter eggs and details. Remember that challenge in Paris to throw a coin in the fountain at the entrance? Well, Sapienza brings another fountain, another challenge. This time, to throw five coins in, when 47 can only bring three in at the start of the level. Luckily, the Sapienza map is absolutely chock full of coins. For example, just inside the gates to Caruso's mansion, there lies another fountain which not only contains a secret entrance into the basement, but also several coins already thrown in. This challenge also seems to track progress between runs, so you could also just start the mission, throw three coins in, and then restart and do it again. Probably the most famous easter egg on the level. Far out on the ocean, you can see a sailboat with four bells hanging from various points. If you bring a sniper rifle to the top of the ruins behind the Caruso estate, and shoot the four bells in a specific order, lowest note to highest note, you will summon a kraken, which will rise from the depths and pull the ship down below. There's currently a weird minor bug in the Hitman 3 version of the map. One of the entrances leading into the Ether Lab, the one on the upper level behind the manor, has a sign which is only visible when the door is open for some reason. It appears and disappears as you open and close the door. It's fitting that in the Italy level of the game, there would be an appearance by the two most famous Italian video game characters of all time. In the sewers beneath the church, you can find a red-garbed plumber named Mario. And in the tunnels beneath the Caruso estate, you can find a green-clad one named Luigi. In the church, there are paintings lining the walls above the pews. If you look up at the first painting on the left as you enter, you can find Fuzzy Jesus. This is a reference to an infamous failed restoration of a painting, which went viral in 2012. Famously, this easter egg wasn't found for over two years after the release of Sapienza, hiding in plain sight for a shocking amount of time. If you're interested in more details on that story, I'll post a link to an odd header video detailing it in the description of this video. An image of Sapienza is the default wallpaper on many of the computers found throughout the game. The kitchen assistant who you can steal a keycard and uniform from in the first day on the job mission story is playing Hitman Sniper Challenge on his computer. The NPC is based on the winner of a contest, the player who got the worldwide high score on that game. You can pass a bookstore on the Sapienza streets, which is not accessible, but if you peer into the window, you can see one of the books on sale is Helmut Kruger's autobiography. You can overhear a man in the beach area take a spam call and argue with the salesperson for several minutes before just buying whatever is being sold to get the call to end. Okay, 
already have you already have my okay um then just uh, just bill me okay i got it yes you're welcome you're so welcome okay okay bye One of the challenges in the level is called Investigator, which asks you to pop all of the inflatable alligators hidden throughout the level. One hilarious alligator can be found in the bathtub of one of the apartments in the city. If you try to enter the mansion while dressed as the Plague Doctor, the guards will mention Assassin's Creed. Maybe. I keep finding references to this easter egg online, but while I was able to get plenty of other weird dialogue from wearing the outfit, I could not get the supposed Assassin's Creed dialogue to play. I don't know what you're supposed to be, and I really don't care. But that looks like something Steven Tyler would wear. Can't let you through. Not before hell freezes over. Anyway. One of the more obscure easter eggs on the map is that, if you wear the Plague Doctor disguise, run across the map to the speedboat hidden behind the ruined tower, and shoot this unmarked bottle, you can find a sewer key. Take this sewer key to the crypt below the church while still wearing the Plague Doctor outfit, and you'll find the lighting has been replaced with a sickly green glow, the music has become spooky Halloween music, and most notably, skeletal hands now reach out from the ground and walls, trying to grab 47. One of the paintings in the observatory, by the door to DeSantis' room, is hanging sideways. One of the strengths of the level is getting a chance to hear the scientists talk about their own fear of what they're creating with Caruso's virus. Not only can you hear the scientist during the absolution mission talking to her deceased friend, but also overhear a scientist and a gardener in the wine cellar below the mansion discuss how the scientist is trying to be fired so he no longer has to work on the project. You do know this is a 79, right? Vintage year, pretty goddamn expensive. Yeah, I do. Got it from Caruso's private stash. <laughs> Are you trying to get fired? As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Look, I'm I'm on a two-year contract. Either will sue me blind if I leave. And, and if I mess up intentionally on the job, so, oh, trust me, this way is better. You know, one day you guys are going to have to tell me exactly what you're making succeed, you don't need to ask. Oh, that bad, huh? Worse. Because it actually sounds like a good idea, like the lesser evil. Man, I wish I had been wiser when they approached me. Caruso? No, God, no. The man's a genius, but I have been water coolers with more charisma. No, I was with DeSantis. Oh, that explains it. <laughs> Tell me about it. Men, we're nitwits. Here, here. Cheers to nitwits. Yeah, to nitwits. You can hear a townsperson complaining about someone who keeps calling him about a VHS videotape he rented from Blockbuster and never returned. No, I don't even have a DVD player anymore. You realize what year it is, right? Nobody even uses that anymore. It's all streaming. How are you even still in business? Don't get mad at me. I'm mad at you for still being in business. Don't call here again. I'm changing my number. If you take DeSantis out without being noticed or her body being found, you can find her bodyguards wandering the map looking for her, whispering, Miss DeSantis, where are you? Dr. Lafayette, Caruso's new therapist, can be overheard mentioning that Caruso isn't the first troubled genius he's turned around, specifically name-dropping Jordan Cross as a former patient, presumably after Cross murdered his girlfriend, Hannah Highmore. In case you had any doubt left that Caruso is unstable and dangerous and needed to be put down, you can overhear him working on his memoirs, providing his own insights into the development of the virus, which he calls Project Semiel, because he's an edgelord. If you start as a mansion bodyguard, you can hear DeSantis calling into Ether and giving an update on his behavior. She even mentions her recommendation that Caruso be killed, unless his new therapist can pull off a miracle.
Otherwise, I see a little choice. Go the other way. Well, you wanted my recommendation. Excuse me, that is none of your concern. Roberto is a distraction, nothing more. You can find a battle axe stuck in a support beam in the ruined fortress behind the Caruso estate, presumably a relic from when it was still functional. Shooting it will knock it down and let you use it. Sapienza is the fan favorite level of the first Hitman, and probably sits behind only Whittleton Creek as the fan favorite level of the entire series, and it's not hard to see why. The level is expansive, gorgeous, and intricately detailed down to the last corner. It's no surprise that so many later missions revisit Sapienza, as the level begs for expansion upon. It also hides some of the most outlandish and well-hidden easter eggs, like the Kraken, or the Skeletal Hands. However, while Sapienza is one of IOI's best spaces, I've never actually felt like World of Tomorrow was one of their best missions. Caruso and DeSantis are great characters, and there are plenty of interesting opportunities for taking them out. The methods available to take out the targets feel specifically related to the characters' personalities, which is the best thing one of these missions can do. Having the two targets who are explicitly at odds with each other is brilliant, and it's an idea which the series would refine later on. The place this level has always broken down for me is the Ether Lab. The Ether Lab is not nearly as fun to explore as the town and the manor are, and destroying the virus always feels relatively limited. There are essentially three ways to do so, and two of them are fairly well hidden. These non-assassination-based objectives are something the games always end up having an awkward relationship with. As the games went on, they seemed to get better about offering multiple ways to complete them, or just offering ways to skip them outright in Hitman 3, which is extremely smart. It's not a fatal flaw of the mission. It's still a strong mission that stands alongside Paris well, and there are later worse missions in the first game. I've just always considered there to be better ones as well, but those missions are a topic for another day. I do love this mission, and destroying the virus ends up being a non-issue once you know how to use the USB from the Absolution Story mission, or where to shoot the stalactite to destroy it. I just wish those things were a little better directed for new players, and not something I needed to hear about from YouTube. That quibble aside, this level is where the comedy of Hitman really starts to come into its own. The exploding golf ball, the expired spaghetti sauce, the ridiculous home movie Caruso has made, it's a level full of life, humor, and energy. The criticism I do have of the mission only exists in comparison to a series with a lot of what I consider to be perfect levels, including three in this game alone, which I consider to be more perfect than Sapienza is. Once you've completed the mission, the game plays a cutscene titled The Key. One week later, in Johannesburg, a man is walking in a parking garage talking on his phone about the destruction of the ether virus, and trying to figure out who would be behind it. Once he gets to the car and hangs up, we see the shadow client was there all along, waiting for him. Boss is unhappy. I followed you from Italy. I guess when you're invisible, you stop looking over your shoulder. You did this. Iago exposed you. ICA did the heavy lifting. I just pulled some strings. Yeah, you mind. How do you expect... I play dirty. That's how you defeat a stronger opponent. You strike from behind. Now give me the key. You have a family? Trust me, if there's a weakness, Providence will find it. I'll take my chances. The key. Fine. Won't do you much good. said the same thing. Thank you, messenger. Don't. I just killed you. Then we're even. This cutscene gives us the next step of the Shadow Client's plans, and shows us how it was him behind the scenes taking out this contract too, just like the last one, using a different client as a proxy. Iago was just a stepping stone, 
with that dossier exposing the virus and the shadowy cabal behind it. This is the first time we've heard the name Providence, giving us a name for who the Shadow Client is working against. The man who the Shadow Client kills here plays the role perfectly, with calm confidence even as a strange man holds a gun to his head. Whoever Providence is, they're so confident that they're untouchable, that this man, seemingly a lower level player, seems only amused at first by the gall of the man with a gun to his head. This also shows us exactly the lengths the Shadow Client is willing to go to, with the audience getting to see him get his own hands dirty for the first time. He's going to fight dirty, he knows what he's up against, and the only way to win a war against an overwhelming force is to keep them from realizing that they're even fighting it. We'll see what this key the Shadow Client is retrieving was for later on. Next time, we'll move on from a fictional city in Italy to a real one in Morocco, the city of Marrakesh. Thank you, babe. 